Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back. Hope you've had some reasonable lunch and you're all settled and comfortable. Uh, we're going to look at flow metering this afternoon, particularly ultrasonic flow metering. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about it from the perspective of a water utility, uh, Anglian Water, and specifically for potable water, uh, which is more of my expertise. And my colleague here, Andy, from the uh, supplier side. Thank you very much. So uh, if we start with the first slide. There you go, Keith. I think okay. you're going to kick off. <laughs> okay. So as we went into the um, periodic review, we were trying to understand what was off what looking for in terms of flow metering and what were the challenges that we were going to be facing. So yeah, I'll do you want to go? Yeah, it's fine. So, sorry, my, my eyesight isn't enough to see the screen down there, so I'll have to keep looking up. So from the final determination itself, we were looking at three different factors that stood out in terms of flow metering that were worrying us. One was the leakage reduction challenges that we had, Another was the decrease in supply interruptions, and the other was the reduction in pollution incidents, which is obviously more on the water recycling side than the clean water side. So the obstacles to achieving those outcomes that we could see, we can't manage leakage and unaccounted for losses unless we can see the flows, which is an obvious thing to say, but we don't have all the flow meters working and in the right point that we need all the time. Um, so are they sufficient, are they appropriate, and is the network metering actually working okay? And what's the cost of these intrusive meters? So if we're trying to break our networks all the time to put these meters in, can we afford to do that, both in terms of the civil costs, but also in terms of the shutdown, the interaction on the customer, and the water quality issues? If you take a large main and you drop it, and you're trying to recharge it again, sometimes there's problems with particulates uh, in there when you're trying to recommission. So personally, the challenges that I felt I was facing at the beginning of this AMP, I have to excuse us because the clicker's only working when it feels like it. Try and lift it up. Uh -huh. So to do effective network monitoring, the sort of issues that we're trying to balance is the capex control. Can we afford to do everything that we're being asked to do? Can we deal with the planned outages? So as we're trying to put new equipment in, how are we going to look after those customers as we're breaking into their networks? And can we get that flow meter uptime? Because it isn't just about putting them in, it's about getting the signals to them, it's about keeping them running, keeping them accurate to make sure we've got the right balance. Putting in thousands and thousands of meters and then not maintaining them isn't an option for us. We've got to make sure that everything we put in is actually working to hit that effective network monitoring, which is what we're trying to achieve. So my challenge is, there's a bit of a but and a bit of a so in terms of this. So clamp on flow meter technology specifically in my world, they lend themselves to installations without those supply interruptions. So it felt like probably ultrasonic clamp ons was going to be part of the answer to the problems I had at the beginning of the AMP. But unfortunately, I've been around 35 years. There's quite a reputation in my business for clamp on ultrasonic flow meters, not quite being there, if you know what I mean. So we had to sort of deal with that three decades worth of history um, if we we're gonna do them and do something with them for this particular amp. So we would need, as water companies and as Anglian Water, the real world confidence that non-intrusive invasive flow metering can really deliver robust and reliable solutions. Just dropping it on the pipe is no use to me. Looking back at that previous slide, it's got to work accurately and it's got to keep working and it's got to be within my capital limit. So those are the sort of things I'm trying to balance out. So from 87 to uh, 2017, I, don't, I know I don't look old enough, but believe me, that's when I started. Tricky to install. We had trouble trying to get the ultrasonics to work in terms of the pipes. We didn't always know what pipe we had, what the wall thickness was, what the coatings were, and what the uh, cohesive layers were inside that pipe as well. All sorts of things against us in terms of fitting them. Very easy to disturb. We found once we'd fitted an ultrasonic, anything that moved around it, it could disturb it and stop it working properly. And occasionally we found they just stopped working and we couldn't really explain why, but then they started again and that sort of doesn't build you the confidence that you want. And it all felt a bit temporary. That ultrasonic world for flow metering felt like a good temporary solution. It didn't feel like a permanent solution. And overall, what that led to was we were skeptical of the reading. And if you're skeptical of the reading, it's not really a lot of use to you. 
Thank you, Keith. So uh, that's the, uh, the background that we found ourselves encountering when we first started working with Anglin. Um, a fair and healthy dose of skepticism. So we started off by working with Anglian on their most difficult applications. They threw the challenge to us and we started working with sewage pumping stations. Um, that was from 2017 and, uh, well, it continues, but the, the, from 2017 to 2019, we were only doing sewage pumping stations. Then we started doing uh, clamp-on, um, basically, uh, in buried IP68 installations. Uh, the initial reaction had been, we don't want to bury. We've, had, we've done buried installations before, they're unreliable. But the cost benefit was of such a, an advantage that it had to be considered. So we went on to do a lot of buried installations, IP68. Then obviously onto MSERT's applications. So this is all building up um, a, a degree of confidence for Anglian before we finally, I think it was around about 2020, that we started working with Keith on clean waters. So it's back to yourself, Keith. So the first um, push that we had really to go back into this world and experiment again, um, this particular site I believe is our Pittsford Reservoir, but we were finding one or two of our non-infra sites, so our treatment works, our uh, reservoirs, our pumping stations, where we had really quite difficult to get at pipe work and the civil cost of installation of trying to drop these big pipes and put in a uh, full ball flow meter. Uh, was, was really quite difficult. So we thought, well, let's just try again. Let's have another go uh, and let's see if we can get anywhere with these particular uh, meters. And our water recycling colleagues had told us that they started this relationship uh, with Flexim and they seem to be getting all alright, so you know, why don't we give it a go? So we put two or three in um, and they were on particularly awkward sites. So where we've got uh, mains that were surrounded in concrete that we were struggling to dig out uh, and drop in a, a electromag where we've got them underneath um, suspended floors and we didn't really have the space to manoeuvre and we could just strap something around but we couldn't really bolt anything up around them um, or where they were high up and it's particularly difficult in a CDM world because we were facing up to the fact that we couldn't just say to a contractor go and install a flow meter anymore in a CDM world we have to do the design we have to make sure we give all the information and we have to make sure that the risks are appropriate and trying to bolt in a large flow meter up there becomes quite a challenge in terms of CDM so we thought we'll, we'll give it a go and we'll try a couple of these and we'll see how we get on and also we had uh, one or two large electromags that had failed and just because of the sheer size of them we were just interested to say well we've got this chamber we've got this metering point and we've got a little bit of a spigot of pipe, so what we got to lose? Let, let's strap something onto it and see how accurate it is and see how we get on. So we did quite a few of those. Um, and again, we just started to build up that little bit of confidence and those specific awkward ones, we're starting to think, yes, perhaps this wraparound ultrasonic might be something in the mix uh, that we wanted to explore again. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> so this is basically a, a, a video showing you a typical installation. So basically we need to measure up the pipe diameter um, stainless steel banding, stainless steel rails, all tightened up on the pipe and then basically we put our transducers into those rails as our transducers. A solid pad, we don't use any, um, any grease or gel. These are going to be buried, we need a, a, a device, a, a connection to the pipe that's not going to weather, that's not going to uh, seep away over time. So that pad is good for 10 years without any maintenance. Then bring the transducers back to the transmitter, set it all up, forgive the fact this is in German. Um, and then once the meter's all set up, then basically put a shroud on, mechanically protective, and then the whole unit can be buried and, uh, and left. I'm sure that um, those of you who are here probably know the, the technique, it's transit time, time of flight. So we're, we're not talking about Doppler, it's, it's basically transit time, we send ultrasound a thousand times a second. One signal goes with the flow, one, si one signal goes against the flow. With the flow, we'll see in a second on the animation, with the flow will actually go faster, it's being sped up. Think, if you will, about some rowing down a river. If you go with the stream, you go faster. If you go against the stream, you go slower. So with the flow goes faster, against is slower, and we end up with a delta T. And that delta T is directly proportional to the flow rate. So that's basically the technology. And then what can we expect in terms of accuracy? Well, all of these meters come calibrated. The calibration certificate that comes with them 
shows that under ideal laboratory conditions, we're achieving plus or minus 0.3%. However, you have your inherent meter accuracy, which is impacted by your pipe geometry. And that pipe geometry will affect your flow profile, which in turn will affect the accuracy. So the expectation is that if you give us 10 diameters of straight length upstream and three diameters downstream, the installed accuracy will be 1%. Now, very often, of course, we don't get 10 up and three down. Now, we have flow correction software, which allows us to go to 2D upstream and 3D downstream. So that gets us out of a lot of problems. But fundamentally, the better the straight lengths, the better the flow profile. This is demonstrated on this diagram. So basically, we can see, as you hit an elbow, you throw your maximum flow to the outside of the pipe. And transit time, of course, is taking an average through the center of the pipe. So if your maximum flow is thrown to one side, we will see more low flow. So you'll never overread; you'll only ever underread. So we did a lot of work with PTB, which is the German metrology uh, company. And uh, PTB, we worked with them under various different disturbance characteristics and developed these um, disturbance correction factors, which allow us to go to 2D upstream. We also have developed advanced meter verification. We know that the, the mag meter world that, that Keith was talking about has very often you'll go along and, and verify a mag meter. It's not a, a recalibration, it's a verification, but it brings convenience because who wants to pull a meter out and get it calibrated? So basically we've developed um, advanced meter verification, which is giving you monitoring, health checking. It's giving you, and again, I can't read that down there, so predictive maintenance. Um, diagnostic data, basically when the meter is installed, we take a footprint, a fingerprint of the installation. And from that point onwards, we can compare um, on future references, um, future verifications against that init initial diagnostic state. Any changes will basically give you a, 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 an indication of something going on that you need to be concerned about. And then we can generate a verification report, be it annually, biennially, whatever your quality system requires. And that can be um, uh, generated as a PDF that could be filed, uh, again, for your quality uh, system. So this should remove the need for removing meters from uh, the pipe and actually sending them back for recalibration. So I think this is back to you, Keith, and I think you're going to have to look up there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're trying to develop a standard approach then to um, portable water networks and to do this, although it's a standard approach, you need a variety of different options. So we've still got Electromag in our list of things that we fit. We've still got probes that we fit. We've still got Helix that we fit. So there's still those bits and pieces that we use. But what we were looking at specifically was with this particular ultrasonic, can we reverse some of that previous experience we've had? And we've started fitting these in 2017 and so far we haven't had one of the fleximeters fail on us. So, so far the reliability is where we'd hope it was going to be, so that looks okay. Can we use the, the clamp on metering to hit those goals for AMP7? Well, can we use them at scale in a clean network? Well, yes, if you bear in mind that the capital cost of a clamp on ultrasonic is probably going to be more than electromag but the installation costs are usually much much less because you don't have to break that pipe you don't have to drain down your system you don't have to rezone your customers so when you look at the whole job yes it does hit the capital equation as well uh, can we do it with zero supply interruption blatantly yes you don't need any supply interruption at all and that totex looking at the whole thing the commissioning costs the purchasing costs the installation costs the ongoing maintenance costs yes it stacks up in terms of totex as well for a particular cohort of flow metering uh, installations so we just needed to make sure that the installation wasn't going to bite us because some of these that we wanted to do were five meters down in the middle of a field so we've, we've still got some challenges there just to go through and what we're trying to avoid is the traditional approach of whenever we put an electromag in in Anglia Water, we've put a bypass around it as well. And if you're talking about a three inch meter, that's not a major concern to put a bypass as well. Yes, it's extra valves and washouts and fittings and foot space, but it's not too bad. When you start going up to 20 inch, 24 inch, 30 inch, it becomes another matter entirely. So the left hand side, very, very capitally expensive. The cost of just that hole is eye watering. On the right hand side you can see the, the footprint and the installation is a lot lot easier so it's a prize worth going after 
So we thought for these deep ones, um, we'll just check, do we need a chamber at all? Can we really deal with these costs? Because a large sized chamber in Anglia water, you can easily burn 30,000 pounds putting a chamber in the ground. Um, by the time you've designed it and, and you've uh, bought the chamber itself and you've fitted it and you've reinstated around it. So we've tried exploring with pipe buried in the ground, excavate the hole around the pipe and then put the transducers in so you've just got a hole in the ground now and you fit your flow meter. What we tend to do on these is we'd put, we'd double up on the flow meter so we'd put two lots of sensors in so that if one fails in the future we've still got the other one so we've got redundancy built in. That's a little bit of an extra cost in terms of the capital but it helps us in the long term cost dramatically. Then put in your chamber sections as you usually would above the pipe but then stop and fill it with gravel. There's no need to bring the chamber up to the full height because these are perfectly happy to be buried and you can just bury them in soil but what we've chosen to do is to put this and we call it a coffin around the pipe around the flow meter so in the future we can dig down to that coffin take the lid off the top take out the gravel very quickly and you've got a nice safe secure chamber there to work in to work on your, your flow meter to change your sensors or whatever you need to do and then you just reinstall it with soil and backfill and you've got no reinstatement costs. You haven't got your tarmac to redo or any problems there. So the idea of putting a chamber in, but stop and then just backfill, that's sort of that mid ground. And we found this is working extremely well. And this is giving us the benefits that we need to just help with that Totex approach and that, uh, that cost balance. So just some typical installations. Uh, we've got, um, we, we do have to have power for the, the flexing meters, so either mains power or solar power. So they usually have to be in the kiosk, either existing kiosk, because most of the electromags had a kiosk anyway for replacing, or put one in if new. Uh, just either side as you came in there, there's a bollard. Uh, we do manage to get some of our kit in bollards as well, although the flexim uh, transmitter at the moment won't go in the standard bollard. Uh, right hand side there, you can see uh, the chamber. It doesn't have to be particularly huge, just as long as there's space to work around and the sensors can be fitted in all sorts of different uh, alignments. So sometimes they're side by side, sometimes they're opposite. You can bounce the signal in different ways. And if you've got any questions on that, ask him, not me. <laughs> um, and then at the bottom there, we're just showing this one is a chambered installation. So it's in the ground. On our non-infra sites, our supply managers still love a good chamber. Um, they don't like us backfilling things and hiding them. If it's on all their sites, they like a chamber. So we still have to have some chambers. But if that was just a few yards on the other side of the fence line, I wouldn't be putting the chamber in. I'd be burying it and forgetting about it. So that's just a site ownership thing there, and it's a preference thing. Uh, so a couple more. Um, the kiosks, you can put your larger kiosks in if you need to on the side of the road, or say something a lot smaller will do. Power is always the issue with that. Um, and we don't tend to in Anglia put ladders into our chambers. Um, because if you've got a ladder, you've got to test it. So we'd rather just leave the chamber bare and take a temporary ladder with us. Um, doesn't have to be posh. Yes, you've got to fill up your size to stop anything getting in there, but we're not talking about watertight chambers. It is just to stop vermin and everything crawling about. Um, they are really quite cost-effective uh, installations to be done. So our sort of conclusions, going through all of the challenges that we've faced and the different cost balances is, if we've got a large number of customers at risk so we don't really want to shut this pipe down and if we've got a reasonably big pipe so this isn't three inch technology really this is you're talking about six inch and above where you start to get your, your payback uh, on all these different factors so the, the larger size pipes and where you've got power so you either need mains power or we put some solar power in nowadays uh, with inverters that can provide this we've now um, made the change to say that Flexim is our preferred meter of choice. So we've actually moved away from the Electromag onto the Flexim for that cohort of meters, but we're still using Electromags in some instances and we're still using the other technologies as well, including the, the basic helix. And that is about it. Thank you, Any Keith. questions for him? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if this is working. It is switched on, but I'm not sure if that's working. I'm just curious, given the presumably you've got plenty of hard water in it, how you monitor the internal condition of the pipes? 
it's so, a, internal condition of the pipes. With hard water. Okay. So basically when we install, I mean, the, some of these pipes are obviously going to be ancient and they'll have all sorts of accumulation on the inside. But at the point that you install, if you're working, you have the signature and the footprint under those conditions. From that point, we can monitor the change in diagnostics over time. So if you've got a really appalling set of uh, internal conditions, you probably won't work at all. But um, it has to be you know, really quite considerable before it won't work. Any other questions? So I was just wondering how you're getting this data back. Is that via SCADA or data loggers? So in Anglian, um, all of our flow meters, we have a regional SCADA system, a regional telemetry system, and we're using outstations from various suppliers, which are basically loggers with SIM cards in them now, that all go back either via the cloud or direct into our SCADA system. So yeah, we've got the full um, trend there. Usually at 15 minute data, we tend to go for to protect battery life. Um, that goes into our SCADA system, so we've got instantaneous and trend. We don't tend to use it for alarms, and we tend to have them set so they only dial in twice a day. So in Anglian, on the remote sites, in distribution for DMAs and DZs, it's usually twice a day, but it's 15 minute resolution. Once you get onto a site and you're wired into your site telemetry, you can have it one metre resolution all the time, depends on whatever your site's based on. I don't know if there's anything from other customers, any experience from other customers? With regard to telemetry, telemetry. And how signals. again, we'll work with whatever the customer wants. I mean, your basic standards are 4 to 20, and we have two 4 to 20s, and some of the very oldest mag meters, of course, had two 4 to 20s, one for forward and one for reverse. So we have that ability. Um, but then you get into all sorts of buses, mod bus, profit bus, back net. It depends on what the client wants. But the vast majority, I think, are just 4 to 20s into things like a Technolog cello or something like that, and just transmitting the data that way. Probably, probably just two more questions, if there's any more. Good afternoon. What's the accuracy of your condition monitoring in terms of assessing the accumulation of solids inside the pipe? Well, I mean, if you were actually changing the diameter, the internal diameter, you've got to remember what we're actually measuring is velocity. So if you change the internal diameter, we're we're, we are multiplying velocity by cross-sectional area so you will have an error if you've got an accumulation, but I would, uh, I would base it. Well, if we're going on a brand new pipe, we will see that change and you would indicate it way before it affected our accuracy. But if we've gone in on a pipe that's already got an accumulation on the inside of the pipe and it's not known, but we're working, then yes, there might be a small error there. But the larger the pipe goes, the smaller that error will be. You know, if we're down on a six inch pipe, then obviously it's gonna potentially have quite a, an impact on the flow measurement. If you're on a, you know, a, a 42 inch or 60 inch, it will have a very, very small amount of impact. What we tend to find from an Anglian point of view is if we're on a site, it tends to be quite high velocity because that's the source of water. So it tends to be fairly clean and we have self-cleansing pipes by and large. In distribution, it's usually our, our um, modeling that picks up there's a problem. So we've got head loss that we can't explain on the pipes and we've had to wind up the head loss on the model to get it balanced. Then we'd know that we have to be really careful when we're fitting one of these in. We can do the wall thickness test and that will give us an indication of cohesive layers, but yeah, it's, it's not an exact science. So you're absolutely right. If you've cut out a section of pipe and you've put a brand new instrument in and you know exactly what the diameter is, that's probably the gold standard. But we're talking about potentially for these big ones, £100,000 worth of work sometimes to do that on some of our big angular sites. Whereas we can do this for a few thousand or a few tens of thousands. So it, it's balancing up that accuracy need with the pragmatic Totex challenge that we've got. We've got literally one minute left. Anybody else? Okay. We'll say thank you very much then. Thank you very much. Tony, I know on uh, pipe thickness, I'm probably on distribution networks, it's not going to make much of a difference, to, to be fair. Um, we've obviously done that risk based, based approach on the wastewater side, so that you're well aware of. But thank you for that. And our next speaker, uh, we're going to see something slightly different. A lot of the open channel flow work that we do in the water industry is applicable to other industries. 
And our next speaker is Rob Burton of the Coal Authority. And it's interesting stuff because a lot of what we do in wastewater and a lot of the learning we've got from the Coal Authority on flumes and weirs, we can also take the, the, the work that they've done in the Coal Authority and apply that to the water industry. So I'll let Rob take over and stop my mumbling. And um, take it. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm Rob Burton. I'm the hydrologist at the Coal Authority, and I'm going to talk to you today, today about some of the weir installations that we're doing at our uh, treatment schemes and elsewhere. So the contents of my talk, I'm going to introduce uh, myself and then a bit about the, about the Coal Authority, um, talk about why we collect the data we do, um, about the uh, issues around accuracy of thin plate weirs, so, um, and that's really important. Um, and then I'm going to give you two examples. One is the, uh, the coal weir program that we're doing, and the other one is some work we're doing on metal mines uh, with uh, NRW and some, some conclusions. Uh, so yeah, I'm Rob Burton and I'm uh, the hydrologist, lead hydrologist at the Coal Authority. Um, and I've been here since uh, 2020. And before that, I was 18 years at Hydrologic and the last eight years there as, um, as head of hydrometry there. And the, the Coal Authority, um, we are a, a non-departmental public body uh, connected to bays. Um, so it's business, business energy and uh, industri industrial strategy. We were formed in 1994 um, to take over the historic uh, uh, mining legacy and liabilities from, from British coal. And our job is to protect the environment and to keep the public safe. And just some um, statistics of the, some of the key things that we do as an organization from our last annual report. Um, the key ones for me are the ones I'm involved with. So um, we treat, treat 128 billion liters of water, which um, compares to some water companies who are about half the size of Anglian Wessex or Yorkshire, those that kind of size of water company. Um, and also we, we're very keen on recycling. So we recycle more than uh, three quarters of the, the iron solids from our, our treatment schemes. And we recycle the reed bed material that we, 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 we take out of reed beds. And then the other things that we do, um, do a lot of stuff with uh, mining reports. So if you buy a house on a coal field area, then you have to have a mining report um, we do a lot of responses to, to planning applications, but also this, this part here about keeping the public safe. So um, mine entry inspections, investigating um, subsidence issues um, and that kind of thing. So our, our monitoring network, um, in terms of the coal work we do, um, we, we operate um, 82 mine water treatment schemes. Uh, we have about 2,000 monitoring points um, with about 200 of them being flow and uh, uh, 400 of them water level. And then on the metal mine, and that, the coal, coal fields are shown uh, on the, the black areas on the map. So the, those are spread across there. And then we work on metal mine work with the Environment Agency in England. Um, we've got a network of sites across the Pennines in the southwest and um, across with NRW in Wales. And for the, for the Environment Agency, we operate three mine water treatment schemes for them and we're currently building one for them. So a typical um, mine water treatment scheme, uh, we are treating, um, removing iron, and they typically have a cascade at the inlet, which oxidizes the iron, and they, then they go, that throws flows through lagoons and reed beds uh, to treat the water. And typically um, about half of our schemes are pump schemes and they will have numeric consents. And half of our uh, schemes are gravity schemes. And the difference I think probably between um, 
a lot of treatment schemes is that our schemes take all the flow. So they're gravity schemes and they take all the flow that comes to them. We don't have bypasses on them. Um, and those typically have, um, because they're gravity schemes, we can't control the amount of water. They are descriptive consents. Uh, why do we collect the, the data we do? Um, it's for abstraction license and discharge consent compliance, uh, mine water treatment scheme performance, um, and for design of new schemes, um, catchment management, so we share all our data with the regulators, so they use it in catchment management. Blowout risk, and that's, um, uh, blowout risk is when you have a sudden outrush of water from a mine, so it's to monitor um, the potential, the, the chance of that happening within a system. Uh, for changes within the mine water system, so that might be increases in flow or decreases that would indicate potential blowout risk. And for mine water heat schemes, so there's a big thing at the moment about um, pumping mine water that's typically kind of 15, 20 degrees Celsius to the surface um, and then using that through a heat exchange to provide heat for homes or for things like swimming pools or other public buildings. The, so what are the challenges that we have um, in flow monitoring at our sites? Um, ochre is the first one, and that's what you get when you oxidize the iron from the water. It deposits all over the weirs, and it deposits all over everything we do. So we need to make sure that we're using things that are self-cleansing as they can, um, or that we're measuring on the, on the treated end of the scheme, and we're using non-contact sensors. Um, a lot of our sites are remote, so they have no power um, and they have um, poor mobile phone signals, so the challenge is there. Um, they are uh, suffering, suffering with um, turbulence, a lot of the weirs, so we're often trying to fit weirs into places where there isn't really enough space for them. Um, the schemes are typically, well not typically, but a lot of the schemes are aging. They were built when the coal mines were closed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, so the need, need of upgrade. And we have uh, challenges with vandalism because a lot of our schemes are open to the public, so people can walk around our treatment schemes, they walk dogs and whatever, and they can steal anything they, they should choose. And um, changing flows, so um, we don't, uh, we, well, we do know, but a lot of this, the mines are deteriorating so the flows from the mines can change um, and that might be due to changes in the mine water system or due to changes due to climate change. So just on um, thin plate weirs, the, the types of weirs that we use a lot, um, they have an ISO standard and they have um, derogations from that um, under, allowed under MSERT. Um, they're either rectangular or triangular, so V-notch. Um, and you measure the water level upstream of them to derive the flow. Um, the accuracy of the water level measurement, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, is the biggest um, impact on the accuracy of the measurement itself. And you must have um, this thing called an aerated nap, so the water must spring clear of the downstream side of the weir. So to talk about the accuracy of, of thin plate weirs, this is the equation for um, the uncertainty of thin plate weirs. Um, and the equation itself isn't important, but particularly it's the things that are in it. So um, in both, in the top one is the for rectangular weirs, the bottom one for um, V-notch weirs. So they have the uncertainty of the discharge coefficient, which is to do with the, the um, the experiments that were done when the flow calculations for the, for the weirs were, were calculated in the shape of the weir. They have the uncertainty in the weir dimensions, so how accurately can we measure the width and the notch angle? Those things are relatively easy to do. And then they have the uncertainty in the head measurement. And the key thing with, with this is that they these have a multiplier on them. So for V-notch weirs, it's a multiplier of 2.5 and for rectangular weirs, a multiplier of 1.5. So that means that the head measurement has by far the largest impact. And then you have other errors. So as soon as you've, met, you've taken your measurements, you put it into a telemetry system, you might have errors in the telemetry system and um, errors in the head to flow conversion, 
or errors due to non-compliance is the weirs aren't quite to standard. So I've told you that the head measurement is the largest, largest error and there's lots of things that can go wrong with that. So the first one uh, is the zero head error. So how accurately is, you, have you set your gauge board to the zero of your weir? Can give you some error. Uh, you then got to install a water level sensor and this sensor itself will have an error percentage of the, um, the distance down to the water surface normally. If you've got turbulent conditions, then it's going to be more difficult to read your gauge board. The sensor is going to have be more uh, more difficult for your sensor to measure accurately. Um, the accuracy of your manual readings. So, can you read your gauge board? Have you cleaned it? Um, is it is it easy to read within a few millimeters? Where you take your measurement. So, um, this idea that uh, you need to be away from the drawdown. Um, so, as the water approaches the weir crest itself it draws down and drops as it as it goes over um, so if you need to be measuring away from there and the, the standard says a certain number of times two to four times the maximum maximum head and if you measure at the rear crest you'll be which a lot of people do you'll be measuring uh, significantly underestimating the water level over the weir and therefore the flow and finally the um, the clinging nap. So if you have a, a clinging nap, um, which the, the impact of that is to draw down the water level upstream. Um, and that means for the same flow, you get a lower, lower water level than you expect. And therefore you underestimate the flow. So if you were thinking, right, okay, these, there's quite a few things could go wrong here. And um, if I get a few millimeters error, or a millimeter error on each of these, I can easily get five or 10 millimeters error. Um, what difference does it make? Um, so these are the errors in the flow that you get from a 10 millimeter um, error in water level. And for, you can see you get quite large differences, particularly when you get down towards the, the minimum head for the structure, but even at, at 100 or 200 millimeters in, in depth. And bearing in mind that the requirement for under the Environment Agency's monitoring certification scheme is that we measure the total daily volume uh, within plus or minus 8%. So it can be quite difficult to achieve that. How do we get the, how do we calculate the, the uncertainty in total daily volume? We take our uncertainty curve for our flow measurement structure, um, which tip is typically uh, like the grey line on this graph, um, so you have high uncertainties at low flows, lower uncertainties at high flows, and you apply that to the data for your site. So you create a typical day of data, if you like, or an average flow, and it's that average flow that gives you the uncertainty in the total daily volume. So you're kind of taking account of the fact that you will have worse than 8% measurement at low flows and better at high flows and the average is in the middle. So just the first example then of what um, we're doing, we've been doing with our uh, weir upgrades on the coal program that we do. Um, the first thing that we did to, so that we could prioritize and decide which sites to, to do first was to prioritize them high, high high, medium and low, according to how important they were. And we've also, uh, we undertook a desk based exercise to review, uh, to categorize them in terms of the quality of the, uh, of the data, the quality of the installation. And we've categorized them excellent through to not fit for purpose uh, with the expected accuracies you can see there. And that allows us, that allowed us to um, inform our um, our approach to which ones we tackle first, but it also allows users within the authority to understand the accuracy of the data they're using. So the numbers aren't necessarily exactly as they think. And the first thing we did was after we'd done the desk-based assessment is to actually go and visit some. And we undertook detailed surveys of the weirs we were looking to upgrade. Um, and we've got a survey form for doing that. 
um, which makes sure you make sure you take consistent measurements um, at all of the sites, um, and includes a lot of the stuff that you would do if you were doing an MSERTS inspection. And the kind of problems that we found, and I've shown a, a RAG rating at the bottom of uh, red, amber, green of what impact I think these have on accuracy. So lots of them with weir plates that were too thick, um, that the plates were bowed, um, they had turbulent approach conditions, they were difficult to access. So if you can't access them, how can you get decent measurements? How can you maintain them? Um, if they didn't have any gauge boards or they didn't have any loggers. And then these, these are the pictures of the ones that are beforehand, I suppose. So on the left-hand side, um, the weir plate's actually on backwards. And you can see also that the weir crest is too low. So we don't have any fall over the weir. Um, the one in the middle here on the bottom, uh, the plate is, it's undersized. The channel downstream doesn't have enough capacity to take the flow. So it backs up through the weir. Um, and the, actually the scum mark showed it had gone over the top of it. Um, and then the top right, turbulence um, in, in upstream of the weir there. I don't know how you, you can't read that gauge board accurately at all. Um, and then on the bottom right, um, a weir down within a kind of three meter deep chamber. Um, I don't know how we were supposed to access that and maintain it. So the work we've done, um, we've, uh, I'm just gonna show you these, but um, we've uh, installed new weir plates and we've installed baffle plates to remove uh, or reduce the turbulence. Uh, gauge boards, all of the sites, and we've put MSERTS compliant water level sensors to, to give us continuous data. So that was my one which didn't have any fall over it, and we've installed a, a new weir plate that has enough fall. You can see the aerated nap there. Um, we've got we've gone for using um, carrier plates so that the, the weir plate is just the smaller bit in the middle. So if the crest gets damaged over time, we can just replace that bit, not, not all of it. Much easier job for us in the future. Um, same thing here, larger one with a carrier plate. The one that was under, undersized, um, we moved to a different part of the scheme and found a location where there was capacity in the channel to, to measure. Um, so baffle plates, um, turbulence on the left, um, and on the right, you can see we put a very simple baffle plate in and that takes away the turbulence. So the advantage of these is that where you're in condition, situations where we don't have enough space here to put, have the um, five to 10 times the, the top width of the weir as your approach length, uh, we can put the baffle plate in and that um, gives us smooth and tranquil approach conditions, which is what the standard asks that you have. So you can fit weirs in places where there's much smaller um, conditions than the standard, uh, much smaller amount of space than the standard would say you should have. And then this is just the same thing here, but kind of you see the turbulence upstream of the, of the baffle plate there as it's come out, out of the reed bed. And that's the other side of it. So you can see that um, you can read that gauge board within a few millimeters and you're getting accurate data. Um, so what do we do with the data? Um, the loggers that we've, um, or the sensors that we've installed, the, the Vega C21, C22, and the digital sensors, so we don't lose any accuracy um, when we're transferring the data onwards from the sensor to the logger and so forth. Um, and we're using the hydrologic flexi logger, uh, which will power the Vega for two years or more longer with solar panels, um, and we'll transfer the data to where we, where we need it. Uh, and that is that we send the data to a web-based system that allows us to see the raw data and allows us to configure the loggers remotely. We send the data also to our operational telemetry system, which is a Snyder uh, system. And that system brings in a lot of other raw data that we have from our pump schemes. Um, so that's pump data, flow, flow meter data, um, and shaft levels, etc. And, we, and it allows, because it's a SCADA system, it allows some control of those. And we're in the process of procuring a database that will allow us to bring in manual readings, so gauge board readings and also water quality data, 
and the gauge board readings will be used to um, adjust the, the logger data from the weirs. Um, and we're in the process of procuring that at the moment. And then all of those will allow users within the authority to, to see the data and to, to be much more uh, responsive to things that are happening out on site. Um, just the improved access one. So that was the, this was the one that was in a deep chamber. All we've done is um, install the weir further up the channel. And you can see that we've installed some gridding that um, allows you to access it. You can walk in from around the corner. Um, so it's easy to, to access and maintain. And then this one, um, the chamber was completely covered over, as you can see in the left picture. And then we've opened that up, putting some gridding over the top of it, allowing making it easy for our operators to maintain them. So what have we achieved? Um, we've moved from having sites where the compliant, the, um, the estimated uncertainty was up to 30% or more, and we were only getting manual readings, uh, manual water level readings, often those taken at the crest of the weir. Um, and we've achieved kind of either good or excellent in our categories, but better than 8% at all of them uh, measurement with 15% 15, 15 minute logger data. And then the installations at, um, at Park Mine. Um, this is the project that we're doing with, uh, with NRW. And that's this uh, Park Mine is located in the uh, Gwydir Forest. Um, and the purpose of the monitoring is to provide data to inform whether we can treat the water from the mine. So it's a, an old metal mine and the water coming from it is high in zinc, lead and iron. And there's also a perceived blowout risk from the mine. So possible of, possibility of water building up within the mine and then causing an outrush of water, which would have a significant pollution effect on the, on the downstream watercourse. So at Park Mine, we've installed a network of about eight sites. I'm going to talk to you about two of them. Um, and they are called level three and four. So they were the, the two of the levels that, that were mined. Uh, into the hill to, to get the, the metals out. Um, and you can see on the, on the picture on the left here, uh, you see the stream coming down on the right, and that's um, the stream on, on the left in the schematic. Um, and then level three and four are up the Gabion baskets to the left. So um, the access you can see is steep, it's difficult. Um, the other things about them on the schematic um, level three is nearly completely collapsed. So we get a very small flow coming through level three and all the water comes through level four. Level four is also uh, got a blockage in it, but, it, but it's much more porous. So it allows the water to come through. And that's the, that's the potential blowout risk is the water level building up behind these blockages and then pushing the blockage out. So before we installed anything, um, that's the adit for level four. You can see it's, it's fairly blocked, but it has, has got water flowing through it. Um, and that is at the top of these Gabion basket structure. Um, the problem we had here is kind of where do, you, where do you install? Do we install at the top or the bottom of these Gabions? Do we install near the adit entrance? So um, there's, there's kind, of, kind of issues. The problem, of course, with the gabions is they're completely porous. So there's water going out in all directions from those. And we need to capture the water so we can measure it. And then level three, um, the adit itself looks a lot better, but it is completely collapsed further up. Um, we considered whether we could install something in there because the channel is much more uh, confined. It's much more regular, but there's health and safety issues in, in installing within mines. Um, and then obviously leaf, leaf issues, etc., cetera, um, in the channel and, and the issues of kind of falling at height, big drops there. So the challenges we had um, were to do with access, uh, safety, ecological constraints, capturing the flow. How do we capture the flow with all these Gabion baskets around? Um, the lack of flow data, so we didn't have any data beforehand, so we could size the weirs and, and flumes properly, except we knew the flow through level three was quite small. Heritage considerations, so these are old mines and they were protected through heritage. Um, and 
um, they were remote sites, so they were difficult locations to get to and remote places to work at, work out in bad weather and also in terms of the telemetry. And the solutions, um, steps and walkways, um, handrails, wherever we could. We avoided the ecology, so we had bats roosting in level three, so we had to install level three when they weren't there. And we had, there's a kind of special lichen that's on some of the gabion baskets, so we installed away from where that was. Uh, we lined the gabion baskets as best we could. And I think the key thing is we installed low head structures. So um, we knew that we wouldn't necessarily capture all the, all the water, even though we lined the baskets as best we could. But if you give it the, the easiest path, installing a low head structure like a flume, then you've got a good chance of capturing it. Um, high gain antennas, um, know when to give up and come back in the summer. So we had an attempt in, in February to install. We did quite well, but um, we did come back in the summer when the conditions were better. Um, and we've installed away from the adits as best we can to protect the heritage aspects of the site. And then these are, this is what we've done. So at level four, um, we built the steps on the right, we built the walkway. So you can get to the, get to the sites. We decided to build away from the adit itself um, on the overflow. Um, we lined the gabion baskets and we've installed two trapezoidal flumes. They give us low flow accuracy because they're narrow at the bottom and capacity because they're wider at the top. And they are low head structures. They will allow the flow to go there and rather than the flow trying to find another way around. Um, and the water level sensor we've installed there is, is because of the ochreous nature of the water is the non-contact Vega. And then at level three, um, because of the low flows, we've gone for a quarter line TV notch. Um, and you can see we've um, built fencing to protect the, um, protect the fall hazard that there was. And also uh, raised the walls to make sure we contain all the flow and gridding over the top and upstream of it to stop leaves and things catching on the weir. So in summary, um, we've, uh, the, the, certainly the head measurement is the most important thing at weirs and there's a lot of things you can do to improve that in terms of the, what we've done with the baffles and the, um, uh, the water level sensors, non-contact water level sensors we're using. Uh, we've improved the quality and the frequency of the data for our coal schemes. That's really important. It allows us to manage the schemes far better. Um, and we've got near real-time data via telemetry. And we are much more proactive as an organization than we were. We were always getting data after the fact previously. And now we can see things coming and manage, manage things better. So thank you very much. Um, I've got a few colleagues who've helped me with this, who are listed there. And obviously the suppliers were um, Simon Bond at Hydrologic, uh, Nathan Walding at EDS. They, they built, some, built the ones at Park Mine for us. And uh, Seven Trent Services uh, did the ones in South Wales on the coal weirs. Really interesting stuff there. We got the next. Here we go. So our next um, presenter, we heard this morning from the regulators, the water companies, the installers, but the one person that we missed out was the the MSERTs inspectors. So coming to speak to us now, we have is talking at the back with the AV guy, is Jim Corris from. Uh, environmental flow, talking to us about the MSERT inspector's point of view. Now, what we've seen this AMP so far is that we're really, really short of MSERT inspectors. Um, and as we heard this morning, the program is only gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So from the MSERT inspector's point of view, it's gonna be interesting to see how we manage this in the future. So without further ado, I'll uh, let Jim take the stage and uh, tell you all about it from the MSERTS inspector's point of view. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Jim Corris. Uh, 
uh, MSERT's inspector and uh, owner of one of the MSERT's provider companies, Environmental Flow. Now we're here today to talk about the MSERT's inspections from the MSERT's inspector's point of view. And I'm rather hoping by the end of this, you've got, you guys have got a better understanding of where we've been, where we are, and where we're heading in the future. And also, I'm going to try and answer three of the big questions we get asked all the time. What are the main issues we come across? What are the expenses of being an MSETS and company? Why is it so expensive? And also, what the MSETS companies are planning to do to resource things going forward into the next AMP period. So, a bit of a brief history, stepping back in time. This is where I first got involved with MSETS. Back, well, not MSETS, the forerunner of MSETS back in 1991, carrying out flow surveys for Anglian Water, heading around all the different sites, carrying out flow checks making sure that the system was up to scratch. If it wasn't, we'd issue a report making recommendations. If it wasn't suitable, if it was suitable, sorry, we'd then issue a certificate performance. Sound familiar? So that's where things stayed in the 90s, right through until the early 2000s, where MSERTs suddenly became a recognised thing as such. So what were the early issues we came across? And that's as relevant today as it was back in early 90s. And we're still coming across a lot of these problems. So some of the images we're going to look at now are more, more modern images, but they definitely are problems we had back in the 90s, back in the 2000s, back in the 2000s and 10s, and it's still going to be a problem going forward into the future. So let's start. This is a classic example. Why clean magmeters? There we go. Classic example. This magmeter was removed before I turned up on site. And I spoke to the guys on the site and said, why was it taken out? And he said, oh, there was a problem. It wasn't reading very accurately. Take a look. Fat buildup. This is real problem on magmeters. Gone are the day where you fit and forget a magmeter and say, no, oh, they're easy. You just fit them, leave them alone. Don't touch them. Ignore it. Anyhow, this is what happens. So the meter was removed. It possibly wasn't a faulty, faulty meter. It could well, all well have been. The reason it wasn't reading accurately because of the fat buildup inside the pipe. So they spent a huge expense replacing that meter, putting in a new meter. What's the new meter that size? 1,500 quid, two grand, thousand pound install cost, 800 quid, thousand pound, get the limits inserted and everything else. So you're looking at three, four thousand pounds worth of remedial work that was carried out when all you needed was a brush. And that could have saved a lot of money. Right, next one. Poor installations. What do you make of that one? Brand new install this was. It was a, uh, a water treatment works and they put in, it was a 400 meter pipe down to the local river course. And uh, they put a swan neck in, mounted the magneter and uh, called us into it, install, insert it. And yeah, the chamber was full of water up to about two meters deep. And we pumped it out. It took hours to pump it out. We couldn't understand why. So they isolated the flow and then all of a sudden the level dropped and we got down inside and that was what we saw. We got a funny feeling behind that Denso tape, there's some gaping, gaping great gaps. If anyhow, we put the clamp on meter on just as a token effort to see if there's any water left in it and it was empty. So the uh, contractor had come back on, dig out the pipework, break out the uh, surrounding earthwork. It cost him nearly as much to dig it all out and redo it to straighten that pipe as it did to do the job in the first place. It's a lack of expertise within civils companies. Not that they're not good, they're good at what they do. The problem is then they don't have the expertise to do flow measurement stuff. It's really is, it's a specialist subject. So when the next AMP comes up and your companies are changing over to a new civils company, bear in mind that we, these things come up nearly always at the beginning of AMP periods because the civils companies come along and they try and work out what's going on we can do that, we'll put a chamber in the ground, build that, we come along and fail it, and then they go, oh, and by the time they do the second or third one of these, they've got the hang of it. Five years is up, you change your amp period, you're back to square one again where you are with contractors putting in things like this. Right, next, bad installations. This is another one we looked at. Four, brand, four mag magmeters installed on the cheap, as you can see. Need to say, grass cutters and wildlife and everything has got to the screens and killed off the displays. These magmeters now failed. So what have you got? £1,500 a piece for one of those magmeters. Four of them. So you've got six grams worth of magmeter. It would have cost a couple of hundred quid to put those in a little cabinet each. Three years down the line, they're replacing them with brand new meters. 
What do you do? Saved a few quid. That's all you've done. This is the frustration you come across as M6 inspectors. Silly things like this. It just, it's not difficult. Spend the money, get the job done right, sort it out. This is another one I looked at. This was a poor design. As you can see, flow is going from right to left. Right to left, left to right, if you're looking at it. And uh, they, put a mag they put the valve right next to the magnetar. The guy was like, well, I installed it. What's, what's wrong with it? I said, well, it's, he said, it's as, it, as the design was. So well, it's as the design was, but it doesn't meet the m -Cert's requirements. It's got a valve next to it. So we tried putting a, magnet, a clamp on flow meter downstream. And that valve was three quarters shut. So it meant any anything that was going through, the turbulence was horrific. It failed. Bad design. This is another example. People using V-notch chambers for sampling and doing everything else possible. This V-notch chamber was installed 20, 30 years ago for a small factory. The factory has now since increased in size considerably. So needless to say, that is a V-notch somewhere under there, completely swamped. And the fact they put a gauge board on the side of the chamber to see how deep it goes over the top of the chamber made me cringe. But they've stuck everything you possibly could think of in there. Research pumps, sample chambers. If anybody's in sampling here, when you want to build a sample, when you want a new sample chamber, build your own. Leave the poor flow measurement alone. Bane of my life. This one, so anyhow, this, this is now being sorted out and new chambers going in and bits and pieces. But it comes up time and time again. This is a few years ago. I visited a site this week. They were fitting in new uh, sample equipment into the chamber, into the V-notch chamber. And what they were planning on doing was taking the sample out from the chamber, upstream of the weir, and then returning it downstream of the weir because they didn't want to affect the quality of the sample. Now the flow only runs at about 1.5 litres a second. So 1.5 litres a second running at 0.25 back to the sample, you're bypassing the meter. Your flow measurement, your M-sets is going out the window. Questionable data. Next one. So this is moving forward slightly to the what we're looking at, Umon, the, the um, spilt EDM stuff. And this is something that is going to come up later on in the talk. I'm including it in this part now, is issues we've got. This is nice and easy from an m -Cert's inspector to rock up to site, carry an m -Cert's inspection on the EDM monitor, which will be coming up in AMP8, which is only, what, two years away? AMP8, something like that. So it's not long, nice and easy. Now, the problem we're going to have with moving forward is the new EDM stuff, which we're going to have to do MCERT, is a lot of it's buried deep underground and access is going to be a nightmare. And also the cost of getting into these alloc sites is going to be astronomical because we're going to have to have extra training for the MCERT inspectors. Plus, we're also going to have the issue of how we're going to get MCERT inspectors to carry out all the checks on these different sites. Now, I think Oliver was having a chat earlier uh, yesterday and they were bouncing some figures around six, 7,000 sites going to need doing and all sorts. I think there's only 15 or 16 m -Cert inspectors at the moment. It's going to be a major problem. So we need to be looking forward, as far as the issue is concerned, you as m -Cert's come, uh, you as flow measurement companies, flow meter, co uh, water companies, sorry, and speaking to your m -Cert's companies and saying, how are we going to manage this? How are we going to move it forward? Because we're going to need some help because we're not going to be able to suddenly on the 1st of January in 2025, jump up and do all of these in one go. So we need to be planning this ahead and getting things organized. This is helping prevent an issue that's gonna happen in the future. So hopefully we can move things forward, but that's next. So this is another thing I guess was, I just mentioned earlier about the costs. Why does it cost so much for an MSET inspection to go out and do what they do? Now, earlier this week, I had been out just some of the kit I carry in my van to go around. I worked it out just to kit the van out in basic equipment is over £50,000 worth in kit, including the van. It's not cheap. Gone are the day we used to be able to rock up on site in a van, in a car, with a tape measure and a hard hat and carry out an MC. You just can't do it anymore. You've got all the various things. You've got open area velocity meters, clamp on flow meters, laser levels to carry out the surveys, confined space equipment. The list goes on and on and on. Plus, all this kit has got to be calibrated and maintained. So, you know, when you ask what the price is, why does it cost so much? And if I... It's, it's expensive. Plus, you know, I've got to put a roof over my head and feed the kids sometimes. And, you know, I've got employ people and bits and pieces, but it's expensive business. And if we've got to do more training and bits and pieces, I think the overall figure I worked it out to be, it comes in about 75,000 pound the time you pay training costs and all the other bits and pieces. It's expensive and it's not going to get any cheaper. So looking forward, yeah, our prices 
are going to have to reflect this going forward with the increased workload that we need to do. So, but looking back, what's so what ongoing? Right, I think the biggest problem we've got with M certs is I'm talking to the converted here. You guys know what you're talking about, but you know all about flow motion. You know what the requirements are. The problem is we're dealing with people on site who don't understand flow measurement. They turn up, they see an empty chamber and think, great, we'll stick a sampler in there, we'll stick a pump in there, or we'll block this pipe up. They don't, they don't understand flow measurement. And that's the biggest gripe I've got at the moment. It's the lack of understanding from other people within the industry who don't appreciate what MSERTS is all about and flow measurement. Now, I, it's difficult to get across to people. And usually when I explain to somebody what's the requirement, what we're trying to do, they understand. And then it, they, they go back to their people and understand, move forward. And then we get the issues with designers coming along. They don't understand what we're trying to achieve and they make things difficult for us to get to. It's, it's that lack of understanding that makes most of this difficult. Plus we've got all the other issues of lack of maintenance, lack of uh, cluttered flow chambers, as I said before, people dropping stuff in. It's all difficult, it's all difficult for us to try and get on top of. But on the, better, on the plus points, we now have a better understanding from all the decent flow measurement stuff that's been put in. We know we've got better data, we've got better understanding. You guys, are, most water companies now and most industry jobs have got allocated teams that look after the water flow measurement stuff, but we're still up against it with the other people within the industry. So it's good, we're getting that. And I think everybody appreciates the scheme for what it is. Hopefully it'll go, it'll keep rolling forward and we will start, as we go forward, we'll get, as you say, discussed, discussed earlier, but bringing more people into the scheme is a good way of moving it forward, especially with the UMON 3 stuff requiring MSITs in the next, next AMP. So it's good, we're getting there. So future issues, as I said before, access problems is going to be a major issue, especially with the EDM stuff. I don't know how we're going to do it. It's going to take a lot of work. I was speaking to one of the Southern Water guys the other day, and they, some of the, if you've got a, a like a site, say under the center, under a high street somewhere, that's got an EDM on it. What are you going to do? Traffic lights, close the road, and bits and pieces. And then you've got what a 200 meter trench down a sewer. You're going to require up team number of staff, rescue teams, all sorts of bits and pieces. Plus, the, you now have to train the MSERT inspectors how to carry out that sort of you know, access. It's not easy, and it's also finding an MSERT inspector that wants to go down into those rather just. Well, not the greatest place in the world to go, so it's difficult. So, it's it's something we're going to have to we have to deal with. And again, we're still going to have the same problem before maintenance issues, poor design, poor installation, and chambers being used for misused for stuff. It's you can see what we're up against. It's yeah, it's not easy. Now, amp seven. Well, where we are at the moment, it's all trundling. I know you you on full fast forward flows and all this lot. It's it all seems to be trundling along quite happily. I don't know from the other water companies where they are, but I think we are moving in the right direction. And I think by the end of the AMP, we should be somewhere close, hopefully. Bear in mind, as I said, we've only got two years to the end of this AMP period. So it's not long and it's catching up on us quick. You want, uh, you want three EDMs? Most of them have been installed now. I know there's a few issues. I went through some, I looked through some of the lists on uh, the Environment Agency website last week and looking at some of the numbers of and there's a few outstanding that haven't been completed yet. But, you know, as a rule, most of them are now installed and doing what they should be doing. And yeah, but you say it's that next period when they're going to become under MSET's requirement is going to be the problem. The Human 4 stuff, yeah, that's we're starting to trickle through with that now. And that's a good place to be. And I think most of the MSET companies are now coping with that. It's the next batch that's going to be the problem. And I think, yeah, it's going to be a major problem. So, AMP8, two years away, UMON3 will increase the MSETS inspector's workload hugely. We're not kidding, are we? It's going to be, I don't know, you say, say, we talked about six, 7,000 sites. I don't know how we're going to do it. It's up to you guys. You speak to us, try and get some, how we're going to employ that number of people. If we're going to be, I don't know how many we do, I think it was, I worked come up some figures the other day. There's something like 5,000 sewage works or something like that to look at and an extra 6,000, we're effectively doubling our workload, if not tripling our workload. And well, we're not gonna triple the number of MSERTs inspectors in five, in two years, because let's face it, it takes five, three to five years to train an MSERTs inspector to do what they're doing. You're not gonna do it. So we need to maybe look at how we're gonna do the, this 
and maybe looking at the train EM search inspector having more of a role and maybe carrying out some element of doing these U13 inspections, EDM checks, is a possibility. But that's up to us guys. We all sit down and chat about it and work out how we're going to do it. It's say so it's a lot of conversations to be had before we start the next the next amp amp A. So I think that's pretty much me done. Any questions? So Frankie. Hello, hope you're all all right. So you've had the technical, now you're gonna get the spanner talk, I'm afraid, so bear with us. So um, I'm Steve French, I work for Zaytech Control Systems. I'm an ECLA technician, also a technical support technician for Zaytech Controls. Um, we are a company that do um, electrical control and instrumentation. We also have a specialist civil and mechanical engineering department that specialise in flow metering and um, we cover most UK water companies across the UK. Um, what I'm going to be roughly talking about is uh, the overview is basically I'm going to be doing a flume replacement we've done, a weir replacement and just common mistakes that I find in the industry. It's not big ones but they are common mistakes. So what we're going to start with, sorry, is data. All I've heard why I've been here is data, how good is data, data is key but it starts with the instrument and the installation. If the installation is not done uh, correctly, it's not, excuse me, it's not gonna work. So we focus heavily on the installation, making sure it's key, making sure it's right, and making sure it's correct the first time. So I'm gonna, oh, that is really bad. So I'm gonna have to read a bit, I'm sorry. So um, when we're looking at installations and design and installing it all, we're looking at key aspects. So we're looking at the application, the location, the instrument selection, the material selection, the power supply and systems applications, and the future maintenance and asset cycles. So when we're looking at the application, we're actually looking at the process. So we're looking at how the, um, uh, sort of the uh, materials, what the treatment process is, if there's any chemicals and, and objects like that. And then the locations, we're looking at where it's positioned. Is it before the flu, uh, before the flu, um, screens, after screens, in between tanks, or at the final effluent. Uh, in, instrument selection, again, we're looking at the M certs on this application here. So we're looking at the tolerance. We're looking at how good the instrument is. Do we need an ultrasonic or do we need a radar? Have we got temperature factors to consider? Have we got locations where an ultrasonic might work, might not work, or where a radar is? So have we got like moisture, vapors coming up, and anything like that, direct sunlight. Um, material selections. This is a major and important thing. When we're looking at flumes, we, we've got a choice really. We've got plastic or we've got stainless. Normally what we do is we go with a stainless um, A4 marine grade. It's, it's, it's got a low corrosive application in cement um, where GRP plastic has its uses, but under UV it can distort and warp. And if you're spending quite a lot of money installing it, you need to make sure that five years down the line, if it's in the wrong location, it's warped and you've got to start again. Um, power supplies and the um, systems applications. This is where like our WIME standards come in. Uh, it's, the, it's the regulations that we do. And we're looking at the power supplies, if it complies, if it's safe for people to use. You can't just be running power supplies across site and um, hope it will all be all right. And with the systems applications, we're looking at, what the customer wants us to go into. So are we going into a logger? Are we going into a SCADA system? Are we going into any recording technology? Because customers have different ways of doing it. So we have to take that into account. And then the future maintenance and the asset life, that's key. If you're putting in an expensive system, you need it to last. If you're expecting your maintenance techs to maintain it and to clean it and your treatment has to clean it, they need to access it and they need to do that correctly. So I'm going to talk firstly about the flume replacement we've done. So the project brief was the rectangular flume had been distorted with the level of distortion beyond acceptable limits. As I just said, you can see it's made out of GRP plastic. So that's warp, that's directly in the sun. There's no trees, there's no shade. So over the years, it is buckled and bent. The previous reports show that distortion has been progressive. So the customer has looked at the flume when it's damaged and he's looked back at the M-Search reports and he could see that the M-Search inspector has done his job correctly and he's identified it 
and it's eventually become out of tolerance and he's raised this. The failed, uh, the failed accuracy at low rates. So as you can see, that's quite a wide flume. At low rates, we're looking at the 8% uh, the uncertainty tolerance. At low flows, like Rob said earlier, it becomes unacceptable and the uncertainty factor is involved. And additionally, the base had lifted and not firmly fixed down. This was only discovered on the last m search inspection where the m search inspector actually managed to get the flow to be um, isolated and could actually bounce up and down on the bottom of the flume. Um, so the installation of the full m search regulatory system that meets the required and insert requirements under all flow conditions was not met. Okay, so this failed its m search inspection. Straight away, the works was non-compliant. That's why we got the phone call. So just to let you know, what we do is if we're doing any flume replacements or any major project works, it's not a like for like replacement. We always involve the M-Certs inspectors. It's easier to involve your M-Certs inspector at the beginning because if you don't and you do changes and you've got your design slightly wrong, one, you're going to look a fool and two, it's going to fail and you've got to start the project again. So as it's the M-Certs customs M-Certs inspector, I'd advise always to use them. That's what they're there for. That's the support that the customer gets from them and just have them involved through the whole stage because when it comes to doing the M-Certs inspection, they're going to help you and they're going to pass it. So we'll go through the construction. So this is where I talk about the spanners. So this is just the prime example of what we've done. So the previous one you can see, that is how we found it. And this is how we've gone. So this is where we come with our civils and mechanical engineers. We've obviously had to remove the old flume and then we've had to remove the concrete behind it. The concrete, believe it or not, took three days to remove. It was that solid. And by the time we was finished, we was using road jacks on it, hydraulic road jacks to get the concrete out. So it was a very hard concrete. I tell you now, Alex was not happy with me by the end of the job. And then as you can see, going next to it, we're actually lowering it. And what we're doing now is we've cut away from under the base. And, what, and where you can see is we've, to, um, we've took about 75 mil lower than we should, because we can. And what we do is we lay a bed of sand under it. And then when we load the flume down, we know we've got the leveling correctly. And then we can take our site levels and we can do our inspection. Because then when we raise it, we should be able to see all the ribs of where the flume has settled. And then we know we've got the correct uh, depth and we know we've got no one's unlevel flumes in there or any sort of, sort of stones or anything in the way. So once they've done that and they're happy, it goes back in. The concrete's poured on one side. And as you can see, there's holes perforated in the flumes. One, that's done to, for support and weight, but we use that so when we feed the concrete through one side, we can actually pass it through underneath poker in it or vibrator in it, and we can see the other side when the concrete's passed underneath, so we can confirm that we've got a solid concrete base underneath. And then once we're happy with that, we can fill that up with concrete, poker in it through, and just making sure we're supported. And then obviously, as you can see, it's in now, the concrete's fitted, and then the flow's the flow is basically put back on. But what we do is we throttle the flow steady. So as we're doing that, we're still taking measurements. We're still making sure it's level. And we're looking for the, a, a flat level flow. And we're looking for a nice flow profile. So that was just as we were switching it on. And then we come to the commissioning. So we've actually installed the LUT system that you can see. We've done a double brace system. Because we're open to the elements and that is a walkway, we don't want the head to be knocked. We've actually adjusted the grid for that to be fitted, but then what we've done after, we haven't got a photo, we've actually put hand railing round so there's no trip hazards or out sort of fall hazards. So what we will do during the commissioning is, we will look firstly at the echo confidence of the unit. So most of the new units have the echo profiles in them or on the software, so we can have a look to make sure we're getting, the, we're aiming for 100% echo confidence, um, which we're achieving. And then what we'll do is we'll then, secondly, we'll use a calibration plate, which is the fixed datum point that the m inspectors use. We actually get them from the m inspector, so it's exactly what they use. We'll take the measurements, and then we'll, we'll compare that to the flow meter. And then obviously we'll also use um, a secondary verification. We'll try and use a technology that's not the same as what we've installed, so we can prove that if, for, on, this, on this case, if the Nevis is reading correctly, to the Siemens than it is. Now you'll see it's reading slightly out because by the time I ran around and got the photo, the flow had slightly adjusted, but it was reading correctly, I promise. And then, uh, so that's basically all that installation. So that is a very simple flow wear and uh, flume replacement system that we do. These are very common. Again, these are sort of generated when the M-Certs inspector are actually doing their job and highlighting those issues because what we'll find is the yearly maintenance probably are not picking up on that because they're not looking 
that deep into the system. Um, so then the second one is, it's quite a unique weir installation. This was actually three weirs into one outlet. So there was three emission points on this one. This was also on a, on a, res, on a res, which discharged into the Thames. So as you can see for a start, just where this chap's standing, to the, to the left of him, that is where it was. So the project brief on this one, the installation of a full MSERT flow regularly system that meets the requirements and certain requirements under all flow conditions. For a start, we're looking at this thinking, well, how are we going to do this? We're in the middle of a lake. And then the existing top water level cannot be changed significantly so as not to affect the normal operation of the reservoir. So what was happening is the water works was discharging into this point and the hydraulic flows were designed not to back up the works because everything was gravity from the works that was the other side of the road. So it was key that we couldn't affect the hydraulics of the flow. And then they wanted a, a, a new required um, scale of 510 litres per second. So again, the installation of a full MSERT flow regulatory system that meets the requirements and insert requirements under flow, flow conditions. So that was the brief given to us by customers. Now, the MSERT inspectors again were involved in this. Straight away, we need their involvement. They're going to look at this system. We can design these systems, but it's best we work again with the MSERT inspectors. So as you can see, there's quite an issue with this. So obviously, MSERT has that 8% target uncertainty overall. But because we have three emission points, we had to make sure each individual emission point met that 8% tolerance before we could calculate it overall. So trying to get that design was quite tricky. Again, this is where we all work together and we find a solution. So obviously a non-BS standard design with a non-defined measurement chamber will be available. There's nothing in the book for this. This is bespoke, okay? This is as bespoke as it gets. There is an example, I think, of this being used in Seven Trent somewhere. I'm not sure, but that is what I've been I've heard on from the MSET inspectors. So instead, we've had to use the large body of the reservoir to ensure the um, minimum approach velocity to each weir is kept in controlled flow rates. So we are actually using the res as a giant baffling plate. Uh, the installation of the box baffles which protrude below down the water surface will also act as future calming and straightening the flow. So again, we're relying heavily on baffle plates and we're relying on the actual body of water. So we're actually trying to measure a body of water and use it as a, as a uh, baffling tool. So we also, like Rob said earlier, we had to make a modification to the existing concrete wall uh, to allow the flat surface already in place to the existing chamber to allow a rated flow. So we had an issue with the, with the, uh, cur uh, uh, the nape again. So we needed to make sure it was aerated. So we had to drop the concrete by 250 mil. And on a, on a lake, it's quite an interesting one. So we've had to install floating pontoons. And if you, if, you, if you do get seasick, don't ever go on one, trust me. So, and also we had, a, we had temperature to factor in. Again, there's no shade, there's no protection. We also had a problem with wind. The direction of the arrows is actually the way the wind travels. So it's pushing the body of water to the outfall, which also is creating pressure of water onto everything we do. So in our load calculations and designs, we have to take the wind into a factor. One, because of the pressure of the wind, but two, any debris or any logs, anything floating is gonna get pushed towards that outfall. So there we go. So we started with, obviously we had the, de the designs with the MSERTS inspectors, that was all calculated. We, pre we had to bespoke make this on site in sections, because if you can see, we was at the top of that photo on the right. That is where our site compound was. And we had to get it round to where the, the yellow circle is. So straight away, there is a factor where there's only a single track road, a uh, walk path. Can't take any equipment on the banks because it's too soft. So we had to walk that. So everything had to be designed so it could be put, all put together and built. And then it had to be stripped down and moved around in tiny pieces. So that there was a, a challenge in manpower. So firstly, what we've done is we've constructed and then we've, fitted the weir plates to, um, to the heights we required. Obviously we've used, um, we've used surveying equipment and we was confident that we had all three weir plates within one millimeter of each other to tolerance. So once they were fitted, we then had to put the baffle braces on. And then what we was doing is these are all chem setted in with marine steel fixings, okay? And there is over, believe it or not, there's 79 fixings in there, all 10 mil, Freddie Bar at a depth of 80 mil. So they've all had to be chem-setted in and they've all had to be tested 
to make sure that they, they will take the strength. And then once we've done that, we've actually put the baffle plates on and then we've actually put cantilever support arm systems for the ultrasonic head. Now, a cleaning requirement is obviously is required for the ultrasonic heads. So we've had to build a bracket system that can be pulled backwards so that they can actually clean them because they can't lean over physically into the body of the water. And if you can also see on that picture there, that just shows you the ripple of the water as it is now. So if you just take that into account, that's how choppy the water gets. And you'll see the effect of the baffle plate, hopefully. So once we've done that, we've installed the instrumentation. So we've had to put a totalizer flow in with three ultrasonic units. So we've had to combine the analog signals together to give one total output. We've put a local total output display at point of source for operations. But this then also go back to their top end SCADA system so they can, they can see their data as required. We've had to build a custom made kiosk. Again, that's all had to be to WIME standards. So there was a power supply of about 300 meters running, the same with telemetry systems. So they're looking at about 900 meters of cable that went in just to power and get the signal back. Radio and um, uh, GPS, and, uh, sorry, SIM card technology and that was not allowed due to the area the customer did not want that using. So we, we didn't get into that. So we couldn't radio link. Um, as you can see, we fitted sunshades and temperature compensators. And as you can see at the top photo, hopefully that shows you the baffle working. So you can actually see the choppiness of the water, but inside the baffle is smooth. So that is showing that that is working correctly. And then you can see the bracket system in use. So it's on a chain. So the ops can go up to it, walk, pull the chain. Nobody has to lean over a handrail. Nobody's losing a hard hat in the water as they lean over or no one's getting caught doing something they shouldn't do. They can easily clean it and there's no excuse. You can see how, once the platform's removed, how deep the uh, baffle plates will actually sit in the water. So they're about, uh, they're nearly two meters high. Okay, so that just gives you a scale of how deep or how big we've had to sort of design this. And then you see this free, all with service loops, all maintenance proof. If anything's needed, there's all local JB. So if a technician needs to replace something, it's quick, it's easy, it's one man operation. And there we go, we've got, the, we've got that magic piece of paper we all love. So as you can see, we've got the top one working. And again, if you go back to see how big that baffle plate is to that, that shows you how deep the water is and that's how we've had to drop that reservoir to work on that. So that was, um, that was quite a feat to empty a reservoir that low over a period of time and sustain that level as well. And then obviously, we are funny enough, I was on site about six months later. As you can see, we've got a bit of buildup of um, algae in that. We've also got a swan that decided to make a nest because of the shelter. So nobody could go near it then because it's wildlife. So I don't, we of course, we, co we created a habitat. And then obviously on the far light, that's commissioning. That is, that is roughly what we'll look like with commissioning. We're checking, the, we're checking all the loop signals back. We're checking the echo confidences. We're getting the parameter downloads for the handover documents. We're collecting as much data as we can. And then at the bottom is the M-Certs inspectors. We leave them be when they're on site. We don't go near them. We don't poke them. We don't touch them. We don't annoy them. And then we get, hopefully, we get what we've got in the middle. So as you can see, each LUT has got an insert, or each, should I say, emissions point, sorry, has got an uncertainty factor of 3.72. Overall, we're at 6.4. So we're within all tolerances, and that's passed. And then common mistakes, I'm just, I've gone quite quick on this, but common mistakes we find, and I find them all the time, is sensors. Because we pick the wrong material, they corrode. If it's on an inlet, you've got, you've got high gas content, you've got, you've got rain, you've got elements, it's going to rot the steel. I always say, go stainless steel, go marine grade. But also be mindful, if you're working around it and you're drilling anything else, if you're drilling metal around stainless steel and the swarf gets onto that stainless steel, it's going to corrode. It's going to, you've got foreign bodies on there, so always make sure you keep that stainless steel clean. Also, a bugbear of mine is people that put transmitters on south-facing walls. That flow meter failed and caused a, and went over its 14 days of data. I think it's 14 days, am I right? 40, sorry, thank you. It 14 days data, and that was EA notified purely because... That sat in the sun and got to 51 degrees with a heater that's permanently switched on inside as well. So, and that wasn't even on the hottest day of the summer we had. So that failed. That took out that water master and it also took out the data logger next to it. 
that was probably about a three and a half thousand pound repair. And that was supposed to be a new installation. So there was, that could have been moved to another wall somewhere, or it could have had something different just to keep that heat. Flooded sensors, another one. Now that failed because it flooded, but it also wasn't potted. Okay. But also potted sensors can damage because what happens in when they're in chambers, temperatures, it contracts, it expands. The gel is good as a solid unit, but if it's touching the plastic and there's enough gap from the expansion, it'll eventually break away and it'll just let the smallest amount of water get onto the back of the EEPROMs. It will kill your meter. So when you're putting something like that in, either put like a flood alarm in, a probe, a simple probe to tell you if the chamber's flooded or put a sump pump in if you can get the drainage. It's simple things like this that can save you a lot of embarrassment when you tell the EA, I'm sorry, it was because the chamber flooded and we're not doing our maintenance. I've, I've seen it happen, it's embarrassing. And then the, the fourth one I found not long ago, um, someone asked me to look at this flume and just said, do you think it's okay? Do you reckon we can use it? Well, we can't. One, that's on the inlet and that is ferric dosing. But what somebody's done is put a drain off point next to it and the drain off point failed and it had been slowly water torturing itself over time and the ferric had burnt through that stainless steel flume. That hasn't happened in five minutes, okay? That could have been prevented, that could have been seen. That ferric ideally doesn't want to be falling in the middle of a flume anyway. That could have been brought half a meter forward, it would have been out of the flume and you wouldn't be replacing that. That's on a, I think, I believe that's a 300 liters a second inlet. That's gonna have to have over pumping put in and a new flume because that needs to be compliant for the new humans that are coming. So how much is that going to cost? A simple mistake or lack of knowledge could cost a lot of money and it will cost a lot of money. And then we've got this one. So obviously as part of installing, we do maintenance, we do checks, we help water companies keep up on their annual um, checks. We don't do M-certs, but we help get the M-certs ready. This was a probe I found. This is an application issue. now. This is on an inlet that's known to be heavy grit. Would I put that technology in there for a start? No. Why did someone put that technology in there? Because they probably got sold it. They didn't know what they were buying. They was told it was worked. I had to clean that off as part of the inspection to get it to read. Can you see the difference in data? The red is when I've cleaned it. The blue is when I've not. So if you're asked by your company, your water company, and a developer wants to put a thousand houses on, and you're trusting that data and you say, yeah, our works can take a thousand houses and you're going off the wrong data, what's gonna happen? I'm not gonna look an idiot, but the person who said you can do it is gonna look an idiot all because the sensor won't clean. Also ask the point, what was the ops doing? Are they removing it? Are they cleaning it? Should, no. And that is very quick. I knew it would be quick. So if you've got any questions, ask away. If not, I'm heading to the bar. No? Brilliant? No? Lovely. Right, cool. Yes. Right, ladies and gents, for the uh, final session in the Flow Forum this year, we've got Marcin from ATI Badger Meter. He's going to talk us about pipe monitoring in remote locations using MBIT. So, Marcin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Oliver said, I'm Martin Kubat from Badger Meter, um, and today I would like to um, talk about um, pipe monitoring, leak detection using clamp-on technology. So first of all, I'm representing company Badger Meter. So who is Badger Meter? How can we help? And who are we? So Badger Meter is a company, it's an American company. Uh, we were found in 1905 in Milwaukee, United States. And Badger Meter has always been um, a water company. So that's this our main focus um, using quality and quantity products to um, serve you, serve your application and help you solve your problems. So today I'm going to tell you about the challenge we faced in Norway. Um, so together with our partner company Compouter we were um, helping them and helping their utilities to save um, non-revenue water. So in some cases, uh, those all small utilities 
are having losses up to 73% of water. So they find out that they can divide their uh, existing network into DMAs and DMZs and uh, check the uh, inlets and outlets and compare um, the flow uh, uh, between the meters. So they take our clamp-on ultrasonic meter, which is called TFX5000. Um, by the way, you can also visit our booth here and see how that meter is performing. So we have a, like a live demo where you can play, you can see how it is programmed. So that, together with a problem and together with a leak cell, um, which is the name for the product our partner came up with, um, ended up with a certain solution, um, both portable and fixed. So you can see they took that stationary meter, they put it in the Peli case, filled up with the batteries, and they um, are able now to put that meter into the chamber without any power supply and leave it for uh, one week. So the meter in standard has a data logger, so you can store all the parameters um, and then after that evaluate. And on top of that, you can also connect uh, our beacon system, which consists from the uh, with the LTE endpoint, and that LTE endpoint or NB-IoT communication sends the data to our cloud-based system. So every day you get the um, data from the flow. So also, um, I want to show you the fixed installation. So as you may know, in Norway, they have a multiple um, places or applications without um, available power supply. So what they did, they um, invested in the solar panels and they also put batteries inside the cabinet. And on the right photo in the red um, boxes, you can see the transducers um, installed on the pipe. So. The main advantage is that they don't shut down the flow. They can put the sensors on an existing and working um, installation. So they also um, reducing the cost down to minimum, not cutting the pipe, not shutting the flow. Um, so and the installation takes only a couple of minutes for the trained personnel. So how does the non-invasive meter work? So we call this as a transit time technology where we send ultrasonic signals according to the flow direction and against flow di direction. And there is a certain time difference between these two paths or um, ultrasonic beams. And this time difference is um, directly proportional to the flow velocity. And knowing the pipe diameter, the pipe material, we can then calculate the flow and the flow rate. So as I said before, one of the main um, benefits is non-invasive operation, which doesn't require um, cutting the pipe, welding, screwing anything to the pipe. You just put the sensor uh, on the pipe, you position them um, in a certain spacing distance between each other and that spacing is given you by the software and then the meter is ready to work. So the system works using um, the meter itself, the NB-IoT LTE endpoint and sends the data to our beacon system where then you can evaluate, you can connect that system with your existing billing systems. Also, the uh, beacon is available to download uh, to your uh, smartphones, uh, either iOS or Android systems. Our portfolio of a non-invasive clamp and ultrasonic meter consists now um, of three different meters. So the first one, which you see on the left side, is called TFX500W. And this is like a low-cost non-invasive meter designed for measure only water. So W stands for water. The 
the middle one is a TFX 5000 where you can actually program the liquid you want to measure. It doesn't necessarily need to be water. It can be water with glycol. It can be glycol. It can be fuel or any other liquid uh, which is um, capable of um, um, tra tra um, transporting ultrasonic waves. Um, and it also can work as an energy meter. So we have an option to connect two RTD sensors and you can measure energy. The third one is a portable meter. So that means you can take it with you. It has a data logger on board. Uh, it has also the communication. Um, so that can help you with some troubleshooting or check your application before you're going to purchase the stationary version. So the meter is quite accurate. So we are um, able to get accuracy of uh, plus minus 0.5% of reading. Um, as I said, we could also use this as an energy meter. Um, we can compensate the flow uh, to the sound speed and temperature. So that's why we are able to get this um, high accuracy. So Beacon. Um, doesn't need any infrastructure, doesn't require any infrastructure from you. So everything you need is to have NB-IoT endpoint and um, cellular network. So we are using a cellular, existing cellular network. We don't use any additional antennas, cabling, um, routers, amplifiers. This doesn't need to be purchased. So every meter is connected to one NB-IoT endpoint and that endpoint sends the data four times per day. It collects the data from the meter every 15 minutes and sends the data four times a day. So one time is fixed while other three are configurable and you can set the timing where you get the data as you wish. The platform itself allows you to evaluate your network. So what you can see is the general health of the system. Um, you can add or remove those um, cards. You can see graphs. You can uh, select um, uh, the group of the meters or only one meter. It shows you the readings. It shows you the position of the meter, uh, GPS coordinates. Um, uh, serial number, um, uh, customer number. Uh, there are a lot of data um, um, consisted um, in those um, in those tabs. Um, you can also create your own filters. So you can filter um, if you want to see only one manufacturer meters or certain sizes, certain areas. So you can also create your DMAs or DMZs inside the software. On top of that, you can also um, locate your meters, where they are and what is the status of every of every meter. So it shows you those pinpoints, whether blue, which is OK, um, yellow, which might have like a alarm situation or red, which really needs to be taken, taken care of. And um, at the end, I wanted to show you a real data we um, collected from our customer. Um, so you can see at the um, upper part that we have unauthorized usage. So that were um, situation where the utility were informed by the system that something is happening. So what they later found out that somebody connected uh, himself to the hydrant and was taking the water without any um, prior information to utility that he's going to take that water. Also, the, um, the low flow you can see was the um, consistent, consistent leakage they found in the, in the network. So also on the um, bottom um, graph, you can see um, con this, this constant leakage where somewhere in the middle, this is our morning hours where the flow is a little bit higher. So where people started to use water um, in the morning. But throughout the night, it was a constant leak. 
And thanks to that um, solution, they were able to um, find it. So Badger Meter, um, our um, idea, our, what we believe is uh, to find ourselves in every stage of a water cycle. So whether this is um, production, delivery, consumption, um, we, we want to be in all these parts with our products, whether these are flow instrumentation, flow meters, or quality sensors from ATI or SCAN, which are now a part of Budget Meter Group. The last slide showing you what we can offer to you. So this is um, a flow instrumentation. What I just showed you, uh, this is only a small part. So besides clamp-on ultrasonic meters, we have domestic water meters, we have electromagnetic meters, also still volumetric mechanical meters if we want to dose some chemicals. So we have a different kind of technologies we can offer you to solve your flow metering problem. And next to that, I mentioned quality products, which is um, ATI and SCAN. And um, if you are interested and uh, if that caught your um, attention, I would like to um, invite you to our booth where our staff can guide you through our products and um, help you out. Thank you very much. Thank you.